put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Ellen, the 1998 miniseries review. The old ways paganism is being threatened by the impending invasion by Christianity. And the queen of the old ways, the sorceress Mab, played deliciously by Miranda Richardson, who, as usual, pones something fierce as a witch. You know, she made that Kristen Kroik Snow White movie watchable as, you know, the only thing in that movie that made it at all watchable. And... I suppose that's all I should say, so as to not spoil. Now, yes, she... She figures that the best way would be to have a strong wizard on her side. So she creates Merlin as a half-human and half-wizard. However, her plan backfires as Merlin vows revenge on her following the deaths of just a couple of women in his life that seemingly were caused by Mab. I'm not sure I should say much more of the plot, except that Merlin vows revenge on her and over time seeks to ensure that the land will have a good king. This takes pretty much everything, as far as I can tell, from the legend of King Arthur. And, you know, basically, you know, it tells it from Merlin's perspective, but, yeah, you know, pretty much everything is in here. You know, the, the most famous, obviously, you know, Galahad, Lancelot, Camelot, Excalibur, all that. It's in there, it just doesn't show up for a while. And, you know, the focus is really on Merlin and his decades-long battle with Mab. You know, you have these two very powerful magicians who are, you know, on opposing sides. And I, I haven't read the original legend. I'm really not a fantasy person, but I'm told that this gets pretty much everything as far as the material goes, and that it gets quite close to the original sort of intent and tone. There is a just astonishing amount of star power in this, and pretty much all of them are really well cast. You know, you've got Sam Neill as the very determined, you know, and at times foolish Merlin. And, you know, he actually, he does really well both as, you know, portraying the younger, uh, young-ish Merlin and in the sort of retrospective with this old wise man kind of role that, you know, the whole thing is told from his perspective as an old man. You find this out really early on, like, first couple of frames, I think. As his, you know 
great love, you have Isabella Rossellini, and she does marvelous as well. She's very... I don't know, she, she inspires him, I'd say, and really fills him with hope for the future, you know. And she's also quite determined, a pretty strong female role, actually. It's surprising that, you know, this is like the one film, this is the one thing I've ever seen Lena Headey in where she isn't a strong independent female. So, I don't know, maybe the two swap roles or something. Lena wanted to try something different. The... We have Rutger Hauer as an absolutely vicious tyrant of a king. Miranda Richardson also plays Mab's sister, the Lady of the Lake, who, and, and she just, if you didn't see them, or if you maybe just wasn't that good at recognizing faces or something, you would, you would not be able to tell that this is the same person portraying both roles. They could hardly be any more different where Mab is just completely, you know, she, she's, she's desperate to remain, to, to retain her existence. You know, some would say that also her power, I personally think it's more of an, that, that she's terrified of ceasing to exist. You know, she, because, the, and, and this is also established very all if, one forgets, you know, it has that old, you know, which is actually, I think, the original, it's, it's an old way of thinking about, like, deities and sorcery and the like, that if you stop believing in it, you know, it's, it loses its power. And the more people believe it, the more powerful they, you know, these beings are. So, you know, where Mab is just obsessed with remaining in existence. We have her sister, the Lady of the Lake, who I'm not sure has ever actually given a name other than that. In fact, I'm pretty sure she's just referred to as, you know, Mab's sister or Lady. Lady! So, yeah, she's completely, she, she utterly accepts it. And that really goes well with just the entire nature of this character, which is very much that she's sort of an embodiment of water. You know, and water kinda just accepts what you do, you know. You you know, you fill it into something or you splash it around. It's not gonna offer much resistance, sort of, you know, it goes with the flow to be extremely yeah, I'm sorry, I'll slap myself later. And further, you know, sort of proving that not all of the magical creatures in this tale are, you know, that, that several of them do accept their fate. We have James Earl Jones as this sort of ancient, I think he's credited as Mountain King, and he is just this massive mountain. And what's really great about that is, you don't realize that it's alive before it starts talking. And then the moment that that happens, you sort of see, oh, how did I not see that before? It's, it's a really great moment. And his voice, you know, that booming voice of his is perfect for something ancient and grand as a mountain. And he's also quite content with, you know, this potential fate of being forgotten and, you know, ceasing to be alive. Helena Bonham Carter is Morgan Le Fay, the, I believe it's in Helena's own words, facially challenged. The, she, she's She's quite vicious as well, with dreams of taking the throne and being willing to manipulate in order to achieve those ends. And that's about what I'm going to say for her. And she has this speech impediment. And
and you know, yeah, she she looks pretty goth. This is actually before her burdening, so yeah. I don't know, I guess she just always had that quality to her. I, I can actually kind of see that, admittedly. Martin Short. He's not completely obnoxious every second he's on screen. Actually, over the course of it, you find him to be rather sympathetic, which is actually true of quite a few of the characters in this. In fact, the this nice web of gray areas where pretty much everyone can be understood, you know, you, you might hate the character actually, but you'll still kind of see where they're coming from or understand why things go the way they do. And really, it is very much, I personally say, you can side with Mab about as much as with Merlin. And that's quite interesting. And in fact, the only thing that breaks this up at all, I would say, is that it does somewhat favor Christianity over paganism. And, I don't know, to anyone who says that that's so obvious, study about paganism, please. Read up on it. Look at what they believed and their customs and try to think outside the box of monotheism and just... It might not have been ideal, but it worked for them and Christianity and monotheism in general is far from ideal itself. Anyway... Yes, the, the acting in general is just great. It's, you know, and, and the characters very distinct, and all of them with this kind of... Yeah, like I said, you can really see where they're coming from. You can really appreciate their perspective on things. This... Like, like I said, I'm not turning into fantasy. Now, what compelled me about this is that if you took away all the magic, or at least like replaced it with, let's say, technology and manipulation, it would still be a very compelling story, you know. It, it's not the kind of thing where it's just someone saying, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if then there was like a dragon here? You know, it actually has something to say. It, you know, and it comments on things such as the kind of, you know, originally it was lineage that would decide your standing in life and power level. You know, to an extent it still is, but it used to be practically impossible to move out of the role you were born into, and they actually comment on that some, that, you know, the, the son of a king might not necessarily be the best person, and yeah. I'm not sure I should say much else in this video because I really hate to spoil it. It's a really great plot, actually, and like I said, it spans decades. It really shows a lot of different kind of situations in this sort of struggle to, you know, there's a lot of power struggles, actually. There's, you know, at the very beginning, it's this John Gielgud, who's just the tiniest role. He just gets, like, one line and, excuse me, a couple of seconds of screen time, and then he's killed. And Rutger Hauer is now king. And then, you know... Yeah, again, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but it just... It really shows these different kinds of... And, and all this sort of uncertainty, you know, regarding this. And it very much you know, comments on how power corrupts. And you really get into all of these, you know, various chapters of this genuinely epic tale, you know, with different people being in power and different, you know, th there's this continued sort of chess match almost between Mab and Merlin where they make different efforts in order to, you know, win the battle. It 
it's it should be noted that Merlin is a growing wizard, and he, you know, at the start of it, he isn't like completely mastering of his abilities, and Mab is dealing with people losing faith in her and her abilities, so she's also you know, somewhat weakened, so, you know, that affects, they, they have to somewhat, you know, manipulate and things to get their way. Now, I'm afraid that pretty much covers all the positive, and I'll try to ease into the negative. The filming, well, one last positive, the battles are pretty good, you know, it's, it is, as with the filming, where you can really tell that this was made for television, you know, it, it, this was not a theatrical release. The filming, frankly to me, never moved above average. And at times, it's really strange. There's this bit where it follows, I don't know what to call it in English, I guess a flower petal or something. The cameraman goes completely off the reservation, follows this flower petal for like a couple of minutes, and the scene just goes on, and I have no idea. I don't know if they were trying to make it visually interesting and they were like afraid that people would get bored because there's just two people talking you can make two people talking be interesting you know just yeah it's, it's, it's in the way you film it but this goes for a lot of and and sometimes it suddenly goes for a close-up where one wasn't particularly called for and you know, things like that oh another thing i definitely do gotta say this is like three hours but you know you can watch it out and what I mean when you get it on like well the the DVD that I watched it was edited into one thing I couldn't really there, there was one bit where I could tell ah uh, they cut from one episode to another didn't they but usually you can't tell where one episode ends and another begins and so yeah this is three hours of straight watching and it actually really does it is compelling viewing you know I I wasn't bored. You know, the plot moves along nicely enough, and the characters are developed, you know, consistently, so there's never really a dull moment, and it constantly had something to say. Now, I mentioned Martin Short earlier, and that does bring me to the, the humor and the dialogue. Martin Short is this gnome in the film. I think that's what he is. He's some magical creature who helps Mab. He's like the right-hand man, and as, you know, cliche would have it, he's of course, you know, disgruntled and, you know, sometimes makes almost jokes at her. He, he has this power of illusion, so he can, you know, he, he, so he takes on a bunch of different appearances over the course of it, you know, whatever fits with where he is, except one which is this offensive Chinese stereotype that I don't even know if they were trying to be funny or what that was. Anyway, he does this for a lot of the film, and I guess it's inspired by Genie in the first Aladdin movie or something, where they're just making these pop culture references. It's not as overt or as frequent as Genie in Aladdin. Mind you, I love Aladdin. You know, in that movie, it really worked. But here, having these... The thing is that it's the only place where it actually breaks th this kind of illusion of being, you know... F for most of this, you feel like you are in their world, and you feel like you've been transported back to... The, I'm not good with... E history, years, you know, whatever, the Arthurian age, you know, you're transported back to that time, that environment, that whole world, with magic and all this, and then you suddenly have this breaking the fourth wall, almost kind of, you know, not the fourth wall, anyway, you have him just spouting pop culture references and using sayings that are from the modern age and all this stuff, 
And it's not even that that's all the character does. Again, there's some great stuff. He actually has some of the best moments in the film. You know, once it gets to the more serious. But yeah, it's suddenly, for these brief spots, the film doesn't take itself seriously. And I think it should take itself entirely seriously. I think that would have really been the way to go. But yeah, other than that, the dialogue definitely has its moments. But on the whole, I can't really say that there's that much of it that I would really like find myself quoting or thinking back to, oh, that was a really great line, you know. It's just, again, kind of average. One thing I should also say, again, on the positive side, a lot of this is sort of the drama between the various people and sort of, you know, how the people relate to each other and the, you know, these various types. And, you know, that's really good stuff. And again, you know, it works even, you know, excuse me, if you took away the magic, it would still be a great story, as I think it should always be. You know, you should be able to take away the, what is on the surface appealing, you know, and it'd still be a good story that stands on its own. The effects. This is one of those examples of early CGI, which we can just smile overbearingly at and just ponder if they just forgot that it behooves one to mask the effects that you have that don't stand up to scrutiny. You know, I, I guess it's just, they just suddenly forgot that because, hey, we can do this on computers now. I guess that means we... Watch movies of the 80s, you know. Sure, they... Their effects couldn't stand up to the scrutiny of more than a few seconds of, you know... Of continued filming. So, you cut to something, you know. You gotta... Werewolf transformation, you know, you start showing the hands, and then you cut to the face, and then you cut back to, you know, or you cut to a reaction shot, you know, age-old technique, it worked, and hey, hey, it actually enhanced the film, because it made you realize, you know, it, because it sort of mimics the reaction that they want you to have, and when we see people distressed, it tends to work. It tends to actually rub off on us. And instead, with this CGI, you know, today, you can have CGI that just goes on for, you know, minutes, hours on end, without any kind of, you know, cutting back to, which is, of course, also a bad idea, because then you lose that characterization. But whatever. Yeah, that's equally as bad. But this is just, yeah. But hey, you can't write questionable effects without the word quest. Some of the effects are pretty decent, but yeah, they do tend to kind of be... Yeah. You know, and again, made for TV. You know, you can't actually use the excuse, well, it's an older film. It's from 1998. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. There, there's films that are much older that fare much better as far as effects go. But yes, it's a pretty good movie and definitely worth watching at least once. Even if you're not into fantasy, I'm really not. It's just, it has stuff to say. It's a good story, it's got great characters, great acting. You know, it's Finally, I do just gotta say, the ending is anticlimactic, and I'm not entirely sure why it needed to happen that late in the story. It seems like it could have happened much earlier, and following that is this shoehorned in happy ending, which I guess is Hallmark's contribution to this thing. It just... It is so very wrong that I, words fail me.
But yes, as a whole, this is definitely worth watching. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.